Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Roger Mosey, the BBC Director of London 2012. With me, my colleague, Phil Fernley from our Future Media Division. And in this session, we're going to do four things. Um, I'm going to talk about the year 2012 and one of the innovations that's going to be part of it. Uh, Phil's going to talk about digital, uh, one of our big objectives, and about the user journeys we're going to have as part of 2012. There'll be a short film about what we're doing already using digital platforms and new technology. And then at the end, a question and answer session where we, we'll answer any honest, decent and truthful questions about London 2012 and the BBC. And I should just remind you that if you do want to tweet, uh, we have a Twitter screen up here and it's uh, hash Pentland. So uh, do feel free to do that. And we'll use those as part of the question and answer session at the end. So um, what we're talking about in 2012 is actually not just the Olympic Games. It is one incredible year for the UK, starting with a special New Year's Eve fireworks, um, all the regular BBC sport events, the marathon, uh, Wimbledon, the Six Nations, all the rest of them. Uh, we've got analog TV disappearing in London, we think probably around April, um, a mayoral election in May, and then you get to all that great concentration of events in the summer of 2012. And uh, it's worth saying that, you know, the, the Diamond Jubilee alone, the first Diamond Jubilee since 1897, if you think about the royal wedding as being an incredible day and a massive set of TVOBs, uh, essentially the Diamond Jubilee is at least three big days of OBs like that. So uh, a royal procession up the River Thames, uh, a huge concert at Buckingham Palace uh, that the BBC is producing, um, and then St Paul's ceremonial and the Mal events uh, on, on the third day. Uh, as well as that, you have 70 days of the torch relay, uh, starting on Friday the 18th of May, the torch going all around the UK. And we see that as being a really big moment for cementing the whole of the UK into the Olympic and 2012 story. And certainly if you look at areas like Northern Ireland, um, they say that to them the torch relay will be the Olympics in Northern Ireland. Some incredible network shots as well as the torch goes through Belfast and Giants Causeway and all the rest. Um, we have 80 days of the London 2012 Festival, uh, the biggest arts event held in our lifetimes in the UK. And uh, if you see down the bottom right there, Leona Lewis is going to be one of the stars at the Radio 1 Big Weekend Hackney event. Uh, that alone is the biggest event in Radio 1's 45-year history. And we'll have 100,000 young people going through Hackney over a couple of days, uh, about a month ahead of the Games, as an incredible music performance uh, to get the Games really going in the Olympic boroughs. And the prom season next year similarly tied into the whole Olympic theme. And then you get to the small matter of 17 days of the Olympic Games. And those are 26 world championships taking place in our capital city uh, over a 17 day period. Again, the biggest sports event we've seen in the UK in any of our lifetimes. Now, the BBC pledge around this, and Phil's going to talk about digital in more detail soon, but um, this slide illustrates uh, the blue is the amount of host broadcast content produced by the IOC's host broadcasting company. And the yellow is the amount the BBC has broadcast from previous Olympics. So you'll see there in Sydney in 2000, really the end of the old linear channel terrestrial TV model, where we only had two linear channels, and we broadcast really quite a small fraction of the host broadcast content. By the time you get to Athens, you've got the red button coming into play and the start of interactivity, and we got to about a quarter of the game's content. By the time you get to Beijing, with six red button streams and the BBC website starting to really fly, we broadcast about half the game's content. And for London 2012, the aim is to broadcast every venue, every day, from the beginning of the session to the end of it. Now, that's not quite every single second of sport, because just to qualify that, at Wimbledon, for instance, we'll bring you in a live tennis feed from the Olympic tennis. It won't necessarily be centre court and number one court and number two court. It'll be just the main action from Wimbledon. But at every venue of the Games, you get the action from first thing in the morning to last thing at night. And if you look at Beijing, um, we didn't actually broadcast any long form fencing, for instance. So if you were a fencing fan, you couldn't actually see any fencing, even with six red button streams on the website. This time, you'll be able to watch the sport of your choice. And uh, being the BBC, uh, we have a five-point plan, and uh, we have five big editorial themes, which we thought would be useful for kind of steering ourselves through the year and making sure that we hit every single base. The, the biggest and most obvious is bringing the UK together round a series of events. Uh, that includes the Diamond Jubilee and the Torch Relay, uh, very much tied in with our public purposes of being the place where the nation comes together for the big moments. 
Um, on the whole, though, we thought we should try to cover the sport as well. So uh, brilliant coverage of the sport is our second big editorial theme, the biggest sport event ever held in this country. Uh, news, critically important to us, is something we do, obviously, globally, nationally, and locally. But owning the news story, and especially our journalism being independent, incredibly important. So if you uh, uh, look at the, the independence of all our programming, Panorama should be Panorama, Newsnight should be Newsnight. And if they want to be critical of the games or to report on them, do documentaries about them, they absolutely must be able to do that. And our journalism will be utterly fearless and independent, even though we are a rights holder for the Olympic Games. Uh, fourth theme, which Phil will talk about, uh, digital. And this is really uh, two ideas. It is the first time the nation will come together in a fully digital era. So analog TV will have disappeared from almost everywhere by 2012. Uh, but equally, as well as those moments like the opening ceremony where everybody's watching, you will have more personalization and more different Olympic journeys than ever before. And then the fifth theme, really, is about legacy. And legacy is uh, crucial, I think, in that we could have the sugar hit in 2012 of everybody watching, everybody taking part in these games and all the events around them. But you've got to make sure that there's a longer term benefit to broadcasting, to the creative industries, uh, to the country out of our involvement in 2012. And that's why we're doing the apprenticeship schemes we're doing in London and now at BBC Scotland. Um, it's why we have community reporting schemes, digital literacy, uh, a whole load of activity which is designed to make sure those benefits don't just stop when the Olympic caravan moves on to Rio. Now, um, I'm going to talk for a moment or two about one of the innovations we're um, planning to bring in in 2012. Um, worth saying, though, that, that when I look back at what people said in 1948, the last time the Olympics were in London, um, we're saying many of the similar things. I mean, for the BBC, it was the biggest thing they'd ever done until that point. And innovation was at the absolute heart of what the BBC was saying it was offering to its audiences. Um, and I think that, that that quest for innovation is something that we take absolutely as part of both our traditions and what we should be doing. And just to watch this very short bit of film, um, they were really proud of what they did. On the roof is an ordinary television aerial used for picking up the picture as rebroadcast from Alexandra Palace. This enables the producer to make a smooth changeover from the studio to the OB program. They were the first properly televised Olympics. There was actually a, a test transmission in Berlin in 1936, but 1948, the first time the Olympic Games were televised. Now, um, what you saw then in subsequent Olympics was also the use of technology, sometimes for the very first time, uh, things which are now part of the mainstream. So uh, Los Angeles in 1984, down the bottom left, HD cameras. So it took probably, I guess these Olympics are the first ones where there's really a mass audience for high definition. I think Beijing was the first time that we'd done Olympics in high definition, but the first time they were captured in high definition was Los Angeles in 1984. Um, 3D, by the way, um, I mean, we know there's nothing new in 3D anyway, but 3D, the first Olympics captured in 3D, Barcelona in 1992 when it was um, analog 3D. Now, what we're going to do in London is for the first time we will capture the games in super high vision, which is a partnership between the BBC and NHK, and we're also working closely with the host broadcaster at OBS. And what super high vision is, is just amazing definition on a screen. So at the moment, if you look at the dimensions of a conventional HD picture, uh, what you get from super high vision is 16 times the definition of uh, a standard HD picture. And uh, at this point, I'll just use my crib sheet to give you uh, key facts to make sure I don't get them wrong. Um, the, the SHV picture, 4,320 pixels by 7,680. And when we distribute it, we're going to distribute it at about 350 megabits a second uh, using MPEG-4 compression. Uncompressed, the bit rate will be 24 gigabits per second. And SHV is designed so that when you sit and watch it, uh, you really get the experience of being in seat D5 in the stadium. So you get absolutely a perfect field of vision for super high vision. Um, and it uses 60 frames per second. It can go to 100, 120. And the biggest SHV screens in time are expected to be 50 feet or 15 meters using projection. And this isn't going to be something that we see in your living room soon. And unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it today because it is some trillions of pounds to have a super high vision screen. But what we will do in 2012, using the Janet network to distribute it, um, is have demonstration sites in three cities, 
Uh, we're currently negotiating uh, uh, exactly where those will be. We're expecting them to be Glasgow, Bradford with a National Media Museum, and in London. So for first time, audiences will be able to see Super High Vision and just how incredible it is. And we hope there will be a mix of uh, recorded action from something like the opening ceremony and also ideally a live shot, which we'd plan to bring in, again, in partnership with NHK, uh, the BBC's R&D division, and OBS, uh, the host broadcaster. So that's one of the innovations of 2012. And now Phil will talk about um, some more of them. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, so I'm uh, responsible within Future Media for overseeing the, uh, the BBC's Digital Olympics. And I suppose my first uh, encounter was, it, was, was this day, which is the 6th of July 2005, which was the day that it was announced that London had beaten Paris finally to, uh, to, to host the, uh, the Olympics in London. Uh, and for me, I suppose that started the journey of what digital could bring, because as Roger said, 2012 is a, a momentous time in terms of switchover, but also the complete explosion in technologies that were happening uh, around mobile phones, around IPTV, uh, uh, and a whole host of other things such as the, uh, the broadband networks. And just to put that in some kind of context, the Ofcom report, uh, communication report recently, said something like 74% of uh, households in the UK now have a broadband connection. And one in four adults have got a smartphone and there were one million internet connected TVs sold in 2010. That trend has continued in 2011 and we believe along with sort of the gaming platforms that are connected uh, to, uh, to TVs, either the PS3 or the Xbox or Wii, there'll be something like 11 million uh, IP connected TVs in the homes by 2012 in time for the Olympics. So really this was the start of the, of the, of the journey. And we looked at what we thought was the, uh, the real opportunities and, and maybe some of the insights that we'd had from previous games that we could bring to bear. Clearly, there was unlimited BBC access. And Roger has described you know, the, the fact that we, uh, we, will, we will publish or, or make available, rather, or, uh, the content from every event and every minute of every, uh, on, on every day. That equates to 24 continuous, live, high-definition streams in addition to the uh, BBC One, BBC Two, BBC Three, and the radio channels. So a significant amount of, uh, of additional channels. Not just producing live, though, but video on demand and on demand uh, editorial, editorially curated content. And the challenge then becomes, from our audience's perspective, how do you actually navigate that content? How do you discover the things that are important to you? How do you discover within that huge amount of wealth of content that which you think will be, uh, will be um, the things that will, will, will mean the Olympics for you. We also go on to deliver it on four screens. It's cons entirely consistent with uh, the, the journey that the BBC Online is going uh, and announced earlier this year with its one BBC Online, 10 product, four platform strategy. So delivering to desktop PCs, to mobiles, to tablets, and to both connected TVs and, uh, and red button. And third thing there, from our audience's perspective, we know that the Olympics is, uh, is kind of different from most sports events. When people turn into a football match or turn into a tennis, more often than not, they're a, a, a heavy user, a heavy, I've got a heavy interest in that, uh, in that event. But the Olympics is very different, it's a very different type of event. And we describe the audiences there as main eventers. They come along once, twice, maybe three times a year to, to kind of sporting occasions. And so when we design our service, we have to design with everybody in mind, not just the sports fanatic. So we talk about delivering a service to main eventers, which principally means a video-rich service. But to those sports fans who maybe do have a deeper interest in it, who go rowing on the Thames in the morning, who swim at the local baths in Edinburgh, who actually follow their athletes and follow their, uh, follow their passions avidly, we kind of need to give them the best opportunity they can to get the most out of the Olympics from their perspective. As Roger said, it's a once-in-a-lifetime uh, opportunity for us. And then finally, around, around choice. We want to make sure that our audiences can watch what they want, when they want, on what they want. So that leads us to the, to the Digital Olympics. And I think it's... Uh, I, I'm going to go on into a, in, in a second to, to describe three of the user journeys that we've, uh, that we've sort of looked at. And the bit of a health warning, first of all, which is this is kind of a direction of travel. We, we sort of um, think of this as a sort of concept car, the equivalent of a concept car. 
We've built some scenarios with every intention that we deliver as much of that scenario as we possibly can, but recognizing through audience research and feedback and through the nature of the dialogue that we have and the way that we build the services that we may not get to, to all of the endpoints that, we'd, uh, we, that we're expressing today. But the, the expectation is that we deliver on as much of this concept car as we possibly can. And as we go through the three, uh, the three examples, I'd like you to, to, to sort of think of three innovations that we're particularly bringing to bear. One is about the fact that we want to create an immersive, intelligent video experience. This is not just video playing out, but it's allowing our audiences to navigate via video, to have data overlays that describe a little bit more about the video, that that choice is theirs to make. If they don't want it, they don't need it. But if they're a sports fan or they've got particular interest in something, that they can do it. So that notion of deeper, deeper navigation and improved user selectability. The second thing that sort of underpins this is, a, is uh, something we call dynamic automated publishing. Uh, it's another one of those sort of three-letter acronyms from technologists, sadly. But the reality of um, trying to create editorially content that surrounds such a wealth of content is a monumental challenge. And if we just did it, uh, just did it via sort of manual means, would be cost prohibitive. So what we've learned through things like the World Cup is, in order to create rich, dynamic pages that reflect in real time the best that our audience can expect about an athlete, a team, an event, that the way we do that is to use the metadata that sits behind that content and to create it automatically. So our ambition is, and following the, the, the successes behind what we did on the World Cup recently, is to create automated pages, and you'll see that through, through the first uh, example, where we look at an athlete and that page that you see is completely automatically generated. The last innovation that you'll see is about that visually engaging navigation. The video is at front and center of everything that the, uh, the audience proposition is about. That's ultimately what our rights are and what we want to show off. But it's also about making that visually appealing from, a data, from the data's perspective and how we, uh, how we design and uh, tell the story through, uh, through data. So, on with the concept car. The first thing I'm gonna do is introduce you to, uh, to Chloe. Now, Chloe is a, an estate agent. She's one of our typical main eventers, if you like. She wants to feel part of the games or be part of the games, but she's not necessarily a sports fanatic. So you've got maybe an interest in tennis, but that's, that's pretty much it. And in the course of her job as an estate agent, she gets talking to uh, a couple of the people who um, she's showing around a flat and they say, you really must go online to the BBC Olympics. It's a fantastic experience. Don't laugh. <laughs> uh, so the first thing, of course, she does when she gets back is uh, rather than going to the BBC, she goes on to Google uh, and uh, types in, as you'll see, the 2012 Olympics and searches for it. Now, our search engine optimization that we've done behind the scenes brings it straight to the fore, thankfully. And what you see here is a way of navigating streams of content, video rich, not just about the games itself. You see she's just moved to a, something, a filter called watching, so it just shows all the video. She can quickly go in and uh, see one of the clips about the hockey, not that interesting. And she goes in and then sees one of the other video clips. This is playing out live. It's the cycling we did well, and uh, we're doing well, so she's pretty excited. In the bottom right-hand corner there, She's basically got a, uh, a, a clicker that allows her to switch between those 24 live channels and the three broadcast channels. And here she's gone in and seen on the swimming, there were, you might have, that was a little bit quick, but what that shows is uh, the number of people who are watching the event, the fact that it's a gold medal event, the fact that there's a British athlete, Rebecca Adlington, in the event. She wants a little bit more data, and on the screen there she's able to pull up the fact that there's some more information about Rebecca. She clicks on the link and goes into, and this is that automatically generated page that I described. All of the news stories, all of the content, where we are in the medals table. And back in time, never, never once moving away from the video, the video always being part of the story, and back to see Rebecca uh, win the gold again, uh, thankfully, at uh, 2012. So really, we're bringing Chloe to the, uh, to the Olympic Games, we believe, through, through that journey that she's gone through. And just to sort of highlight the kind of things, you know, 
really just drawing out the fact that, that that discovery journey around the content was very intuitive, was very easy, very simple, very uh, driven by the video. The fact that we're bringing uh, the live video streams simultaneously, 24 high definition live streams alongside the standard channels, alongside video on demand and uh, editorially curated content. And then obviously an ability at the user's discretion to choose whether they wanted more information or not, or whether they just wanted to sit back and watch the experience. Now to journey two. So Adeola is 21, she's a marketing student in Edinburgh. She's a main event in the sense that she's got a little bit of interest in it, but actually sport's not her thing. But whatever it, whatever it is her thing, she, uh, she, she wants to, uh, to be sharing that experience with her friends. And being a 21-year-old uh, student, she kind of falls into the category of, uh, of uh, what Ofcom described as uh, heavily addicted to, to mobiles. Something like 60% of uh, teenagers are, are deemed by themselves to be heavily addicted. And a half of teenagers uh, own smartphones. And here she is with her smartphone waiting for the bus uh, on her way to her, to her study lessons. As you see, exactly the same kind of navigation as you saw on, on the desktop PC version. She sees the big one, the, the, the Radio 1 Big Weekend that, that, that Roger described earlier, and is able to automatically play out uh, that content. In the bottom right hand corner, she sees a little location flag that says, uh, We recognize where you are, and there's some things that you might be of interest to you around this. She clicks on it and finds out that in, uh, in, uh, in the center of Edinburgh, there's a, a big square which is showing the event live from the Hackney Marshes. She's able to share that with her friends, and her friends come back straight away and say, great, see you there. So here we're seeing how the experience uh, is not just a desktop experience, that it's a mobile experience, and that the mobile experience is very similar to the desktop experience. You get the same information, the same navigation, the same way of looking at it. Now, obviously, the content that we're designing and the services that we're designing aren't just to deliver for the Olympic Games in terms of the sporting moments, but all of those uh, uh, editorial events that uh, Roger described earlier. And, finance, and finally, that because we're able to tap into somebody's location through those phones that are uh, location aware, we can add a richer layer of services for them. Then last but not least, let me introduce you to Connor. Now Connor is an out and out sports nut. He's one of our sports enthusiasts. Uh, he's a plumber and uh, he basically just wants to be bombarded with sport nonstop. That's his life when he's not plumbing. And as you can see, uh, he's uh, like a good uh, British workman uh, at work, uh, sitting on his toolbox, looking at his mobile phone. And um, he's a boxing fan, and a rowing fan, and a football fan, and he's set those up as favorites. You see the, the blue screen coming at the top of the screen there showing this is live updated content. So this is kind of showing a personal experience for him. And because he's a sports nut, he's got all of the, te uh, all of the technology. Here he's now on his PS3, uh, watching the Olympics uh, on, on the PS3. Again, being able to control through the navigation at the bottom, access to a number of other different uh, streams of those, of those 24 streams that we described. Again, each one of those giving a little bit more information about how long before that event's uh, gonna take place, who's in it, and whether it's a, a medal uh, event. And he's now in the rowing. But that's not good enough. He's actually watching that with his mates, and he doesn't want to disturb the event. He wants the main screen to be watching video. So alongside the video, he's using his tablet here or his uh, smartphone or other device to actually create a richer experience for himself. He can go deeper into that event, or he can just surf other things, but it's synchronized with the broadcast, uh, the broadcast channel. So just to finish off his, uh, his experience, you can see really we're giving him unlimited sports action an ability to have that seamlessly across the four screens. An ability for us as a, as a, as a broadcaster to provide a, a, connected, a connected story across all of those devices. So just to reiterate the health warning, this is direction of travel. We, in, we hope, to believe, uh, hope to deliver as much or, or all of this as, a, as is possible. It's entirely consistent with the rest of what we're, we're trying to do in, uh, in the BBC online world. Uh, we're into the last five minutes or so from um, me and him, uh, so please get your questions ready, and you can tweet to uh, 
hashtag Pentland. So uh, last four, three or four minutes. Uh, what I want to do is, is, this is billed as a sneak peek, but I want to show something that we're actually doing already, which is making the most already, we think, of digital platforms and multi-platform. And I think in the old days, the BBC would have done a program uh, called you know, Road to London, which would have been a half hour program in the fringe of the schedule that nobody much would have watched. Uh, what we've been doing this time is doing a series called World Olympic Dreams, uh, which has been following 26 athletes from around the world on their journeys to London. And this has been using online, it's been using the news channel, it's been using uh, 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 BBC World News, it's been on radio, and it's pulling together those stories in a way that we hope is innovative in delivery, but also fresh in the human stories it's telling. I think um, uh, what really brings uh, home to me the benefits of digital technology is it actually helps us tell stories better. It helps people have a richer experience. It also makes sure that we can capture the real spirit of London 2012 and distribute it as widely as possible. So let's just have a look at uh, the film. We make a huge number of judgments about the athletes that we're seeing. We judge them based on what they look like. We judge them based on the country they're from. And of course, we judge them based on the result that they achieve. But what is true for every single one of them is that they've been on a huge journey to perform in venues like this. I'm not happy with just making the final because I want to get that medal. I want to get that gold medal. Your competitors don't just sit back and do nothing. If you want to be better than they are, you have to put a little extra in it. Being tired or being sore or, you know, wanting to hang out with friends or just to watch TV, I can't do that. Motivation when you're actually in the Olympic city just shouldn't be a problem. On World Olympic Dreams, we wanted to find out what it was like when you might be thousands of miles away, never been to London. What are the sacrifices? What do your family say? What are the early mornings like? Winter's the hardest to get off. It's so cold and you just don't want to get out of bed. But I guess when the alarm goes off, you kind of just get up. Like some mornings I don't even feel myself get up. I just kind of get up, get dressed, and I'm, I've left the house already before I thought about it. My parents only used to motivate me to study. They said I would never have a career in sport like I do now. Thank God, with time, I managed to show them that I was capable. And these days, they fully believe in it and support me. What about a boyfriend? Do you have a boyfriend? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just train, eat and sleep, she says. But it's actually more than that. It's about how an athlete is part of the society that they come from and what their country means to them. Every one of you guys is capable of being somebody special. Maybe you'll be the president of this country and one day you're going to lead us and we're going to have a great country. Usain Bolt told us about his sports teacher. I mean, she's like, she's like a second mom. While I was in high school, she, she looked out for me fully. Uh, everything I wanted, she made sure I was always in class. She was, al <laughs> she was always like on me in school. This project is taking me to places that I never dreamt for a second that I would end up. Iraq and Afghanistan are the ones that spring to mind. But in going there, I'm finding out just how easy my sports career was in comparison to some others. 2006 to 2007, this year was very, very bad. Nobody can go normally in the streets. You just want to be home. We, we're still coming here and training, and we see, you know, a lot of body in the, in the river. Despite many years of war in Afghanistan, I still love my country, and I have returned home with the hope that through sport, I will show a good image of my country to the world. Oh, 
World Olympic Dreams is following 26 athletes from all around the world who want to come here to compete. Some of them are sadly going to fall by the wayside. Some of them will make it as participants and some of them will be Olympic champions. It's going to be a privilege to tell each and every one of their stories. So it's now uh, over to you. Uh, we have four roving microphones around the hall. You can still tweet us, and I've got a number of uh, Twitter questions already there. Uh, but when you do get a roving microphone, say who you are, and we can then uh, do our best to answer those questions. So uh, I don't know who wants to signal they want to go first, or if not, I have a question for Phil anyway. Uh, there's a question on the left, I'm told. Uh, depends whether it's your left or right. Uh, OK, there, yeah. <coughs> Hi, Daniel. Um, I think the last Olympics was the first time there was a major online streaming live uh, through NBC of the Beijing Olympics, and, and the take-up of that was massive. That was four years ago. Clearly, the take-up of that is going to be even more massive this time. Can you just talk about how, in your minds, or any discussions you've had around how that is going to be handled on the infrastructure side, that's clearly not really your responsibility directly, but it will have a massive impact. Um, and it not streaming well uh, is not gonna look good for the service. Sure, um, Phil, Phil can answer that. It's worth saying we shipped more video in the first day of Beijing than we had in the whole of Athens. So you're right, it's an exponential growth. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in constant negotiations and uh, conversations with the, uh, the ISPs about what the uh, Olympic service we think will, will will need. A couple of things to, to point out. We've been on a journey, as we've said, for, for a while now. So we, we uh, have a number of things already in, in train, such as the, uh, the fact that when you stream video, we kind of give you the best quality your network will allow. So we, we call that adaptive bitrate. So we, we allow a flexibility to, the, to, to those devices. We talk with all of the ISPs about what the best mechanisms are for actually delivering the content, and we've done a lot of work over the last few years to, to improve those. In fact, every one of the major sporting events that we do, like the World Cup recently, uh, and even major, um, major news stories where increasingly large amounts of traffic uh, are pr um, shipped over the network, we know what the traffic looks like. We know we need to do things uh, at the infrastructure layer, and we're constantly doing that. So we've We've been on a journey with them for a while, and we continue to be on that journey with them. Ultimately, we want to give the best quality of service for everybody who wants to have access to it uh, across those uh, across the uh, across the broadband network, and we'll we'll degrade gracefully through things like the adaptive bit rate and use different technologies to to deliver that. Okay, uh, let me. I'll just uh, do one quick response to a tweet here from. Matt Cook, who says, won't the likes of Newsnight, Panorama, and local news be pushed off the schedules during the games? Um, actually not. We're expecting Newsnight to stay on slot. Uh, nations and regions will stay on slot as well. And uh, the six or seven news hour will uh, stay on BBC One, we anticipate. Um, I saw a question from a gentleman there. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Phil. It's Robin Pembroke from ITV. Are there any plans to um, provide any of the data out through any open APIs for other people to be able to take advantage of? I couldn't go, ah, see, hi, <laughs> hi there. Uh, well, the, the, we don't own the, d we don't actually own the, the data, so we're buying the data in from, uh, from, the, uh, from the Olympics themselves. So uh, we anticipate um, doing what we normally do with our news stories and make our content available through, uh, through feeds like that. Uh, and we, um, uh, we haven't yet come to a, cl a clear decision on how best we get the, you know, the most content we can out, but the, the data itself isn't actually owned by the BBC, so we, we can't just pass that through. Uh, there. Uh, okay, we're just waiting for Mike. Uh, Jake Hansen from Broadcast Magazine. Um, well, you spoke a little bit about um, super high vision. Um, I was just wondering if um, BBC has any plans to show any events in 3D? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing firm yet. Uh, I mean, I said uh, IBC a couple of years ago, we think there should be capture in 3D, uh, and 3D is certainly something we're looking at. I don't think 3D is going to be a sort of all-embracing 24-7 experience uh, for anyone anywhere in the world, but, but 3D is certainly something on the agenda, yeah. 
Hi, uh, Mimi Turner from The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, um, can you just wave a bit more? I can't yeah. see where... Oh, there you are. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know whether you've um, said this before, but can you give us an idea of what the BBC is investing in its Olympics coverage? We said we'll publish that next year. So uh, we'll publish a definitive budget during 2012. Um, I mean, obviously, the thing that is... Uh, the case of 2012 is it's different fundamentally from normal Olympics because there's the Cultural Olympiad and the festival and the torch relay, but we will publish that figure. Do you have a, just a kind of an idea of scale? Well, it's, you, you, can, you can see it's a very big scale. And, and, and the point is, it's a normal Olympic Games plus all the host territory activation. So, you know, we wouldn't normally be doing 70 days of torch relay. We wouldn't normally do... I mean, I, I think one example, actually, is opening ceremony day, where opening ceremony day in Beijing, we came on air at uh, 1 o'clock, about 15 minutes before the ceremony started. I'd anticipate in London we'd be on air all through the day as the torch makes its final journey through London and getting the whole atmosphere of the city. So it's fundamentally different in nature, and we'll publish the figures uh, next year. It, 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 uh, sorry to press you, but... Um, you say you can see it's sort of an enormous scale, but you know, and, and can you not give? Is it like 100 million, more than 100 million, 20 million? You know, uh, uh. It's a nice try. We're not, we're not, we're not going to do running commentaries on the figures, uh, and, and it's partly because actually, technically, it's quite difficult to separate out some business as usual from some additional spend. But we will, we've committed to publishing that figure in 2012, and we will do that. Okay, uh, I have a couple of um, quick tweets, one of which I think is going to be for you, Phil. Uh, is the BBC 2012 web mobile experience compatible with Android smartphones too? And that's from eBona underscore ANW. Uh, sim simple answer is, y is yes, of course. I mean, Android as, a, uh, as an operating system is uh, on mobile has just overtaken uh, the iOS operating system uh, in terms of sales. So, of, of course, it's a, a, a big platform for us. And yes, we will be, um, we'll be making our services available on Android as we would on, on all of the uh, operating, operating service systems. OK, uh, the second one, uh, will all 24 live streams carry live commentary? Uh, and that's from N. Maslev. Uh, yeah, I mean, there may be some right down the bottom end uh, where it may be uh, not Continual. One of the things I found actually as director of sport in Beijing, there was a point when you realised that when you're setting up all this fantastic technical infrastructure, uh, that you go into a little booth where you discover a man has been commentating on weightlifting for eight hours successively. And I think one of the things about the new world is that people uh, actually want the content and the video and the captions. And if it doesn't have commentary every single bit of the way, uh, they don't actually mind that. But certainly all the top streams and the top sports will have live commentary on them. Uh, one for a, qu a question there, question two. Hi, uh, Chris Wilson from Comic Relief. Um, my, my question was really around when you envisage the, the concept car rolling out of the garage. Uh, I, I just did a quick search on Google and currently, not surprisingly, I suppose the BBC site is fairly low down the page. Uh, but if, if your uh, vision is, is to cover events across 2012, presumably it needs to launch relatively soon, is it, b before the beginning of the year? So the, uh, if you're looking at bbc.co.uk slash 2012, that's effectively the, the portal, which, if you like, is the gateway to our, uh, all of our services are from the Olympics. Uh, the, the way that we are doing, I mean, that launched um, with two years to go, I think it was. Yeah, it was a soft launch. It was a soft launch ago, yeah. two years ago. So uh, you're, you're right. There's not much news at the moment. So on the days where the news is, is large, ticket sales and, uh, and one year to go and those kind of things, actually, we've seen really rather large traffic for it. But until the, until the events start to unfold early next year, then, uh, then there's not much news uh, and therefore not much traffic being driven to the site. The reality is, though, the consumption of the content on the, on the site will, uh, will appear all across BBC Online, whether that's on the, on the radio stations or on iPlayer, on the, sports, uh, on the sports site itself. So we expect the traffic to be in a number of places within, um, with, uh, within and across the whole of BBC Online. One of the things that we're very conscious of is that what we can't allow to happen is that uh, on day 18, the day after the Olympics, that there's a, there's a site there that actually there's no traffic going to. So we see this as an opportunity to make uh, our audiences aware of the rest of the, the services that we have available, the rest of the content and uh, products online. And so we're making sure that although it's a gateway to everything else, all of those other parts of our online proposition iPlayer, BBC Sport, BBC News, etc., are also getting uh, getting traffic driven to them. 
So to, the, to your question, it's kind of rolling out all the time. I can see a microphone up there, number four. Yeah. Uh, hi, Steve Farwell from The Guardian. Um, I, I, I may have missed it, but I didn't hear the word you view um, during the presentation. Uh, it, what are the plans in relation to uh, you view uh, and your views on whether it will be part of uh, the 2012 experience next year? So clearly, sorry, yeah. So uh, UView is, is clearly one of the uh, connected TV platforms that we would want to uh, deliver services to. I didn't mention any of them, as it happens, I don't think. Uh, so I don't think UView was singled out for not being mentioned. Um, we anticipate delivering to all of the connected TV service the best possible experience we can, we can do, given the, 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 um, the uptake in those services. Uh, there's a gentleman towards the back with turquoise braces. You mentioned 3D earlier, um, but what have you got plans for in terms of like on-demand uh, and archive content for um, you know, getting into the BBC archive? Well, the, the Olympic archive, uh, we don't normally have a right to. We have a TV archive in perpetuity, the online archive of Olympic Games. We normally get something like three months before to three months afterwards, so we will make that mm -hmm. a great experience. That's one of yep. the things you would get on connected TV yep. as well, potentially. Um, so, and of course, iPlay will be there all the way through as being, you know, the, the, the catch-up for, for the Olympics. But would you run live, or would you consider running live 3D at all, or is there uh, live, Oh, yeah, yeah, so, so, sorry, uh, uh, about 3D. I, I thought you meant about, about catch-up in general. Um, uh, I mean, 3D, uh, you know, the hope is that we will do some limited experiments in 3D, and obviously, we've recently done Wimbledon, uh, which was um, pretty successful. There, there is, it's fair to say, a trade-off between HD and 3D, and what we don't want to do is damage the mass audience HD proposition for 3D, which is a much more minority audience proposition, but we do believe there should be some 3D if we can make everything work technically and um, you know, with a host broadcaster. When would you be announcing that? When would, when would you get kind of confirmations on that? Uh, not sure. I mean, it's something we've said is, is a long-term aspiration and aim. It certainly has moved forward in that uh, now there's been a sort of collation of the interest from broadcasters around the world, and I'd expect there to be sort of firm news probably before the end of the year. We have a tweet here. Uh, it's probably more you feel actually, it's editorial a bit as well. You've talked a lot about access to the content, but what strategies are in place to enhance the conversation around that content from transmediology? <laughs> a great name. Uh, well, we're, we're already expanding our, our um, uh, social conversations around content. I mean, just, just by way of example, we recently started to put increasing numbers of uh, comments on uh, news stories, for instance. We know that people do talk and do want to talk about uh, all of our content, whether it's a news story, whether it's a sports event. Uh, and I think some of our richest experiences online today are things like the live pages on sport uh, on, on a Saturday and, and, on, uh, and on the news story. Now, they tend to be editorially curated for, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but we see that the existing social media networks actually um, host conversations far better than we would, and we don't ever expect ourselves to be in the position of putting a competitive uh, social media network together. We we'll clearly want to work with the likes of the Facebooks of this world to make sure that we have a, an integrated and seamless conversation going on. I think the second example that I showed was trying to sort of talk a little bit towards the fact that there, are, uh, there is an aspiration around uh, that social interaction, whether that's um, connecting people via, via the fact, that in that particular example of the, sort of the mobile phone example, or whether that's connecting them via the conversations online. So we, we, we do have aspirations in that space. And just on conversation, uh, uh, I run a blog, which I'm very grateful for Sunday Express today for uh, finding a blog from March 2011, which they think is new. And uh, also, I've resisted Twitter until fairly recently. But I'm now on Twitter as well, at Roger Mosey, and you're on Twitter as well. So those conversations with audiences actually are very important. Yeah. Quick further tweet, uh, will there be new programming commissioned to showcase the non-sport highlights of the 2012 festival? And that's from Rumor PR. Uh, yes, I mean, I'm not sure it's quite new programming. I mean, there will be 
uh, a lot of festival and cultural Olympiad related programming um, on the BBC. Uh, and we will be doing, in a way, I mean, the theology of the Cultural Olympiad is quite complicated in that there is a Festival 2012, uh, there is a Cultural Olympiad, and the BBC will do some programmes which are inspired by 2012. So you'll see all that coming together, and I think we'll be making our culture plans known again before the end of this year. So there'll be a, a launch of those, I think, before Christmas. Any more questions from the floor? We've got about five minutes if we need it, or if not, if you want to go get an early lunch or get ready for the final session, you're very welcome. No further questions? Okay. Well, in that case, um, thank you very much indeed for coming, and uh, we hope you'll enjoy 2012 and uh, enjoy the rest of Edinburgh. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you very much. No.